So let's talk today about the market and how it is shifting and let's not get that confused with crashing. I'm not saying that the market is crashing, but I do feel that it is softening. I would say starting to be more of a balanced um, market and so, and it is shifting. So let's talk about 12 key factors that can help a seller get their house sold in today's shifting market. Our first tip is going to be staying informed. So there is so much data out there that you as a seller can become informed. And some of the key things that you're gonna to want to know when you're going to sell your house is what is the average days on the market in your hyper-local neighborhood, maybe your city or town, um, so that you can know what to expect. You also want to know about price reductions. Are most of the homes that are going on the market actually getting price reductions? I know here locally in our area, I would say about 45% of the homes end up having to do a price reduction, um, whether it's because it was never priced right to begin with, maybe they took the highest comp and just tried to push it a tad just to see what they can do. Another thing that you want to keep track of is look and see what's actually pending. What is selling in your area? Is it the homes that are older and need to be renovated? Is it investors coming in to try to sell? Is it homes that are already updated and move in ready for that next home buyer? Learn the trends of what's actually happening in your local market and you can get an agent to help give you these reports. Um, if you are in any area that I work in, reach out to me and I would be happy to just give you a few reports just so that you can kind of get to know the area that you're possibly thinking about selling in to know, you know, when should I start prepping for this? Um, how long do I expect my home to be on the market? Because being informed before you actually get on the market will help it be an easier process when we actually have your home on the market. You would hate to expect your home to just be on the market for a week or two, like it was two years ago, and then come to find out, you know, we're gonna be on the market for about 45 to 60 days before we actually get an accepted offer. Not saying that that is going to be specific to your house, but you wanna know average of what's actually happening in your market. And so knowing the market will actually have your head in the right mindset because you don't want to have a mindset of, you know, my house is the best in the neighborhood, we're gonna go in the market, it's gonna sell quickly with multiple offers. You know, you need to be knowledgeable of what's actually happening in your area so that you're in the right mindset. And when you're sitting on the market for a few weeks, you're not starting to panic and get worried that, you know, why is it my house is not selling? You really need to be aware of actually what's happening in your area so that you can have the right mindset and be ready and be patient if that's what it's going to take. Tip number two, and this one is really important, and it is to be flexible. Flexible as a seller means if someone wants to see your house, you need to do anything possible to get your home available for when they want to see it, no matter if it's in four hours, four days, you want to make sure it's available. If this was the market two, three years ago, a seller could have said, oh no, today's not a good day. You know, I have a nail appointment. I don't have time to like straighten up my house before the showing, see if they'll come back tomorrow. Because nine times out of 10, they're not gonna come back. And so we don't want to lose those buyers when we actually can capture their interest. So as soon as you get a request, that they wanna see your home, you need to try to be as flexible as possible to get that buyer in your home because you never know if that is the right buyer for you. And to piggyback on to being flexible, it's going to be be flexible during negotiations. As a seller's agent, I am fully aware that we still have sellers that are not really wanting to negotiate. They are hearing the stories of their neighbors and of their cousins and their friends that have sold homes in the past, maybe the last four years at some point, and they're expecting, you know, to get full price. You know, I wanna counter with removing contingencies. We're not gonna give them inspections, just give them five days for inspections. Um, we're not gonna give them any closing costs. That's crazy. You know, my friend was able to get over asking and not giving any concessions or anything. 
So our market now is, is shifting, it's softening, and buyers more than likely will want some type of concessions. And so as a seller, you really should be open to it. Not saying that you have to take it, but at least consider it because in our softening market, it is going to take a seller to give and take and a buyer to give and take to actually make the deal work. When we have one side, take it or leave it, it is what you get and that's it, the buyers typically will move on to the next one because right now we have a lot of inventory. We have a lot of homes they can choose from. So it's up to us as a seller to be flexible you know, at the end of the day, let them put whatever they want on the offer. We will work on a net sheet, figure out what it is they're offering, minus things that they're requesting and that they need. And if your bottom line is something that you are okay with, even though you really didn't want to have to help with closing costs because you didn't have help with closing costs, if your bottom line looks good, then be open to it. Be open to negotiating. Um, be flexible when buyers are coming in because a lot of times our market isn't where they're coming in over asking and not asking for anything. Those days are kind of gone. And so if you're wanting to sell your house in today's market, you're going to have to be flexible and be accommodating when it comes to negotiations. Another factor when it comes to being flexible is going to be kind of in line with pricing. So if you choose to list your home right over the highest sold comp, you might want to look into being flexible about possibly dropping the price. You know, come three to four weeks in and you're not getting showings or you're getting showings and you're not getting offers, you, you've missed that point. You may want to consider bringing the price down or being flexible with being very, very patient. Now, you don't want to wait too long because the longer your house sits on the market, the less desirable it's going to look. And also other homes are coming on the market and going and it's making yours look like maybe something's wrong with it. You know, why is it sitting on the market? Or, oh, they're overpriced and, you know, they, they're not going to negotiate or they would have dropped the price already. So you don't want to be that home that just is hanging up on the market and not moving. Now. When it is time for a price drop, remember, price drop is not, let's just drop it by $100 so that it gets into people's inbox. That's not the goal. That's not gonna get you a buyer. Yes, it's gonna get your home seen, but normally buyers have seen the homes already on the market. If they're looking for a home, they've already swiped through, they've already seen the home. So dropping it $100 isn't gonna get them into your home. So whenever you're doing a price drop, it's good to drop not 1%. If you have a million dollar house and you are gonna go down $500 or $1,000, that's not gonna work. If you have a $300,000 home and you wanna drop it $1,000, that's not gonna work. You want to always drop it three to 5% to actually get into someone else's, a new potential buyer's price range. Typically, buyers will shop a little bit over their budget but when you drop your price three to 5%, you actually get into a whole new pool of people, of people actually looking. So if you're going to do a price drop in a meaningful price drop to get your house sold, you want to consider doing three to 5%. 10% is even, even better. Um, that will really get some traction, but minimum 3%. If you are a seller that's choosing to list your house high and not price it right below, um, then you may want to just be flexible. Be prepared to be patient. Be, be patient because it's probably not gonna fly off the market. So if you are looking for your home to be priced really well, get other agents to say, oh, this, is, this house is priced really well. Buyers to say, oh, wow, we need to go see this one. This one's priced like be right below other comps. 
That is how you can get more buyers into your home, which in return could potentially give you more than one offer at a time, and that is when you get the most for your home. So when pricing your house, what I would typically suggest is to take the very highest sold comp that's most comparable to your home and list it three to 5% under. That is going to eliminate a few things. It's gonna eliminate people saying, oh, the home's price too high. Let's just wait to see for them to drop. It also gonna eliminate you having to drop the price. So it's gonna make your home look more desirable because it's not like we keep dropping the price for whatever reason, maybe possibly even sometimes people take it as if, as if we're looking desperate. And then when we start dropping prices, they come in with lowball offers. So trying to price it right out the gate is going to be key. And my professional opinion would be listed right below the highest comp. Tip number three, know your motivation. Why are you wanting to sell? You know, there are typically two, two factors of motivation. One, price, because you want a specific number to sell your house and that's it. You're not gonna sell your house if you're not getting that price. Or two, there is something else that has your attention. So there's might be another chapter in your life. There might be another um, city you wanna move to. You wanna move closer to family, move, move closer to grandkids. You know, what is the motivation to selling? Because keeping your eye on that prize is what is going to help you motivate you to be more negotiable and also help you actually sell your house and having your realtor know what your motivation is is going to help because the last thing you want is your motivation to be strictly price and your agent asking you for a price reduction every week you know that that would get kind of frustrating but you also need you know of course everybody wants both you want price and you wanna be able to move because you wanna get closer to family. And in the perfect world, that would happen. Right now in our softening market, it more than likely is not gonna happen. If you are wanting over asking because your, your goal is to be the highest sold comp in the neighborhood because you wanna be able to say, you know, my house was the best house, it, side, it sold for the most amount of money in my neighborhood. You know, if that's the prize that you're looking for, your agent needs to know. You are gonna need to know, you, you know, that's what your goal is and you're probably gonna need to be really patient and we may be on the market for a really long time. It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be stressful, um, but everybody needs to know what that is. Now, if your goal is to truly get your home sold and actually move on to the next chapter of your life, then you need to be more open to know you may not get that highest number, but remember what the end goal is. And the end goal is for you to get the most amount of money that we can in our market and get your home sold. And so remember to keep your eye on the prize of what you're looking for whenever you're looking to move. So remember to keep your eye on that prize whenever you're looking to move. So make sure your agent is aware, you know, an agent is not gonna be here to tell you, you know, this is what you, you need to do. Your home's worth this and it needs to sell for this. And they're not gonna say, you need to move closer to the grandkids and so you need to sell your house for this. You know, that's what, not what a realtor's here for, but we are here to advise you of what is your end goal? What is your next chapter looking like? What is the motivation to sell? Are you selling because you would only get this much money from, pulling, from selling your house? Or is it because you're actually trying to move on to the next chapter? And number four, expect difficult negotiations. Negotiations are not what they were a couple of years ago where as a seller can just throw a price tag on the house and it would sell over asking. Those days are not really here anymore. The market is starting to correct itself. And so it's a little bit harder for negotiations. So just be open when you actually get an offer. So when the market is starting to correct itself, both sides are gonna have to give and take to make a deal work. A seller doesn't have the, the power or the buyer or lack of buyers to be able to name a price tag and just sell their house for whatever. And buyers right now do not have desperate sellers. 
sellers aren't selling because they are about to lose their home. They're not selling because, um, you know, they lost jobs. You know, it's our market. It's kind of a weird market right now. Sellers are selling because they want to sell. They don't typically normally have to sell. And then buyers are, some buyers are holding out. And then we have the buyers, the few buyers that we do have out there. So a buyer and a seller right now in our shifting market are both going to have to work together to make the deal work. Now, after mid-August, we had some changes in the real estate industry and it kind of shook up the market um, on top of buyers, you know, not having as many buyers as we typically did. We also have buyers now that are responsible to pay for their realtor at closing. So it's actually going to be part of their closing costs and what they have to pay. It's another fee put on the buyer where before it was actually negotiated through the listing agent and the seller and then the, they just offered a buyer's fee. They no longer are doing that. <clears throat> so when negotiating, just not saying that a seller would have to, but a lot of times the buyers are needing the assistance and requesting the assistance for a buyer broker commission. So there, a buyer is coming in and asking a seller to assist with their fee, whether if it's a percentage of the sales price or a flat fee. Um, at the end of the day, they have an agreement with their realtor that the buyer is saying, hey, yes, I need you to help me find a house and represent me, and this is what you're gonna charge me. And they've done negotiated that, and sometimes they don't have the funds, and so they will ask, or maybe they don't have all the funds to pay that in their closing cost and their down payment and so then they come to negotiating and sellers are like, hold on, you know, that's coming out of my, my net. I'm having to pay that fee. And so sellers right now are kind of like standoffish. They're like, okay, one or the other, it's either going to be a buyer broker fee or closing costs, but no, you're not getting both. That's dipping into, you know, my net. It is getting a little difficult to negotiate, you know, sellers, don't have a big basket of buyers flocking into the home to buy it. And buyers right now don't have a ton of money and to have that additional fee. So negotiating is getting a little difficult. So as a seller, be open because if the buyer doesn't have it, then they can't buy the home. At the end of the day, that's how it works. If they don't have it, they can't buy it. So if the seller wants to really sell the house, really get your agent to get you a net sheet, plug in all the numbers, see what you would walk away with and see if that's something that you can make happen. If you can make it happen, great. If not, then we can't do it. But at the end of the day, be open to it. Negotiating is difficult and you don't want to lose a deal just because of the fact that you say you don't want to pay for their agent um, because it is a fee that they have to pay. They can't buy the house without it if they've already signed an agreement with an agent. So when all offers come in, be open to all of them. You know, don't say I'm not assisting with buyer broker fees. You know, don't say I'm not gonna help with closing costs. You know, be open to all of them. They can come in over asking and ask for some assistance. You know, it's all about negotiating and trying to make the deal work. Number five, you want to price your house appropriately. So pricing your house is tricky and you can meet with 10 agents and 10 agents are gonna give you something different. You know, some agents say, let's price it really, really low. Some agents say, let's look, this is in the middle. And some agents say, this is what the highest one would sell for. Let's go a little bit over and see what we get. So Knowing the strategy going into listing your home is going to be very important. Um, and a lot of times the most important thing is how long do you want your house to sit on the market? Um, yes, you can go over the highest price and you can be patient. So you are going to decide that you would rather waste time to make more money. Some people, or maybe not waste, maybe you're not in a rush. So you are willing to give up time to hope to get more money. You can wait for three years for an overhouse price to sell and it may never sell. So 
you do have to be a little strategic with it. It doesn't mean the longer you sit, the more likely you're gonna get your higher price. That's not what I'm saying, but going in strategically is very, very important. We are in a softening market. So my strategy would be to look for the highest sold price that is most comparable to your home and list it five to 7% under what they sold for. Um, the reason is, is because the market is softening. A lot of times people are having to lower their price anyway. So why not price it very attractive to attract more buyers? And at the end of the day, if we have it priced great and we have multiple people seeing it, then we get multiple offers. And a lot of times when there's multiple offers, that's whenever you get the very best offer for your home because they don't wanna lose it. They have one shot to get it. So they're gonna give you as much as they're willing to pay for it. And so what do they say about what your home is worth? It's only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So when you have more than one offer, those buyers truly are going in with their highest and best. When you only have one offer, sometimes home buyers are playing how low can they go and so then that's when you really have to negotiate to kind of get to a happy medium and see what is the highest they're willing to go and as far as the seller, how low are they willing to go. But when we have two offers, that is when the seller is sitting pretty and we can really see what that home is really worth. Number six, clean and declutter. This is probably one of the cheapest ways to get your home to sell for the most money. So when a buyer comes into your home, they want to imagine themselves in your home. So having the home clutter-free will eliminate the anxiety of a buyer coming in the home. If they're coming in the home and it's just a filthy mess, if it looks like there's a ton of dust sitting on everything, everything's dark and dim, um, it, it could be a turnoff. So when prepping your home to get it on the market, you wanna make sure that it's light and bright. So you wanna make sure your light bulbs are working. So when they go through the house, they can actually see the house. It doesn't look like everything is dim because we're trying to hide hide something. Um, they want they want to see the countertop. They're not looking for um, what type of you know mixers you have on the counter and how many knives you have and how sharp your knives are that are hanging on the wall. You know those type of things are. Um, taking their eye off the prize because what they're buying and what we need to showcase is the countertops. Like how much countertop space do we have? You know, look at the walls, like how much space you have on the walls to put their, their things on. Where can they imagine their furniture? When we have a house full of furniture, the walls are cluttered with photos, the countertops are cluttered. They can't barely even see what type of countertops are on it. It's very, it's very overwhelming for a buyer and it's very hard for them to see themselves living in the home. So making sure that you declutter and just take everything that's like personalized out um, and just give it a really, really good cleaning would tremendously help your home sell for quicker, more money, um, and just overall be a better showing. Also something to think about when you're decluttering you never want to show your home as being like distressed. You know, oftentimes I'll go to sell a home and it's a recent divorce. It's, um, you know, let's say it is, let's say it's a divorce. When you go into the home, they have like all, um, one side the sink, it looks like it's actually being used and it literally looks like somebody moved out the other. You know, you go in one closet and it's apparent it was like one spouse is closed there. You go in the other closet and it's completely empty. So you never want to expose that the family that is selling is in distress. So we never want it to be apparent that there's, for example, a divorce because buyers will come in and try to use that to their advantage. So, you know, kind of stage that area where it looks like, you know, maybe not just one closet's being used, make sure there's stuff in both. If there's two sinks, don't have everything on one and one completely empty like someone moved out. Kind of spread the things out so that that's, it's not apparent that that happened. Now, it could be, um, God forbid, like a violent situation. So let's say it was a, a family that, you know, in distress because 
they have a kid with a temper problem and that has like punched holes in the walls and the doors and all these things. And like, you can tell that they gave up on their house. Like they, they're just, they gave up and they're ready to sell. A buyer will come in and take advantage of that situation. I, make sure when a buyer comes into the home, they can't sense that the family is in distress in any type of way. And a lot of times when you sell, they're not. But if for some reason it is, you don't want that to be, um, you don't want it to come off as the family is in distress and needs to sell when someone's buying a home. So making sure that the home looks staged, equal, everywhere, your home will be able, it would be a, a more pleasant showing and hopefully get a better offer. And number seven, one of my favorites, keeping everything neutral. So, you know, four years ago, three years ago, we could have painted our house in zebra print. We could have thrown lime green carpet and painted the walls black and threw it on the market like that. Didn't clean it, didn't do nothing. It would have sold. It would have sold for over asking probably because during that time we had so many buyers, so little homes. Homes were so affordable at the time that you can sell anything. You could have sold literally anything. There was, you didn't need to prep it as much. Um, half the time it was sold before it even hit the market. So now that we're in a softening market, that's not the case. We need, we need neutral homes to be able to appeal to the most amount of people because our buyer pool is limited and we have a lot of homes to sell. So when we have more homes to sell than what we have buyers out there actually looking, they're being selective. And so getting them into the door first is gonna be key. And the only way to do that is with our photos. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the photos are great and are gonna attract them in. And if you have two houses in the same market and one is a neutral, easy on the eye, and one is zebra print with purple walls and lime green carpet, you might not even get a showing because there are so many homes that would appeal to more of the home buyers, they're more than likely gonna go see the neutral homes. So making sure that everything's a neutral in the home, even your decor. So, you know, I like beiges, um, creams, whites, I love white, um, the, you know, wood tone, all these neutral colors is what is going to attract someone even someone that likes, you know, bold, they can take an empty slate neutral and make it their own before someone that likes neutral and it's very bold for them to imagine it neutral again. Um, when you see a black wall and you think you have to paint it white, it's a hard, like in your mind, mentally, it's hard to do. When you have a white wall and you need to paint it black, super easy. So think of it that way it's because the home will appeal a lot better when things are neutral. Also, when someone comes into a home, they want to see your, you know, your home for what it showcases. You may have red, a red cake mixer. You know, you may have red, all your appliances match and they're all red and you have them lined up. We're not selling the appliances, we're selling the kitchen. So we don't want to have a bold statement in the kitchen that's going to take them away from the prize because they're not buying your appliances. They're buying the countertops. So we want to showcase our beautiful countertops and not have them looking directly at a, you know, the red appliances that are on the counter because, you know, they're so expensive and you're proud of your baking or whatever. Um, also, like your throw pillows. If someone walks in your house and you have neutral, all neutral colors, they start paying attention to the actual details of the house. Do you have crown? What type of floors do you have? You know, things like that. If you walk in a house and you have really bold, like throw pillows and throw blankets and it's, you know, your eye is being pulled to the decor, you're taking away from what they actually are supposed to love about the house. So when they leave your house, and they're remembering your home, they're remembering your decor, and they've lost the connection of making that home theirs. So you wanna make sure 
you're trying to keep everything as neutral as possible and remember what we're trying to sell. We're selling the home, we're not selling your belongings. And number eight, probably one of my favorite, marketing. You are going to want to make sure that the agent and the realtor that you choose is on point with their marketing. Your home now is one out of 20 instead of two in your neighborhood like it was before. So remember, you know, we need to get them into the home first and marketing is where it's at right now. You need to have professional photos. You need to have virtual tours of your home. Your realtor needs to have a social media presence. Look at us now. If you made it this far into the video, you came to social media to learn, to educate, to um, get more information. People are doing that to buy homes too. They're wanting to get to know the home even before they go into the home. So making sure that you have an agent that is putting your home out there on social media has great pictures to make sure that they are actually even interested in the home, a virtual tour so that they can feel themselves in the home. And when they go into your home, technically it's a second showing to them because they're gonna already be familiar with your home. And that's like the second time that they're stepping foot into your home. Now, marketing is not free. So making sure that you have an agent that is in a financial situation to be able to invest in your home to market your home properly. Market your home is not always just take pictures and put it on the MLS. Actually, it's never that. If you have an agent that says, oh, well, we put it on the MLS and then it goes out to realtor.com, homes.com, you know, all the, all the third party sites, like that is so minute and that is not what's selling homes. Um, you need someone that is putting in the time and the effort to do, you know, the videos, boosting the videos, paying Google to get your home out there in front of the right people. So making sure that you have an agent that's willing to invest in your home is going to be important in today's market. Now, another thing that would be really helpful to your agent is if you actually give them a feature sheet because you want to highlight, you know your home better than anyone else. So you want to be able to explain to your realtor what all the great features are about your house, your community, what makes your home different than anyone else and that will really help with marketing. Um, although a good realtor will be able to market any home, if you can give them special features that makes your home stand out, it will just bring it to another level. And number nine, beware of contingent offers. While yes, beggars can't be choosers, and we don't have very many buyers, be very cautious when you get an offer that's contingent. Contingent offers can get tricky, and if they're not written properly in an offer, it can, can be a horrible, horrible, long, drawn out, bad situation. So what a contingent offer is, is when a buyer comes and says, I wanna buy your house, but I need to sell my house first. Now, oftentimes they come in with an offer, their house is not prepped and ready to get on the market. It's not on the market. No telling how long it's gonna take to get an offer on that. And then now your offer on your home is contingent on the buyer to get an offer on their house and go through with financing and hopefully that deal doesn't fall through and pray to God that that deal is not a contingent offer on another one. So making sure that everything is written and spelled out properly on your offer to protect you as a seller is gonna be really important because a lot of times these offers are written for 60, 90, 120 days out and you don't want to get stuck and locked in to having your home contingent under contract with someone else to sell their home and you've done gave them 120 days to sell their home because that is a long time for your home to just be sitting on the market for all of that you should have just dropped the price significantly and got it sold quickly instead of waiting three months and there's a chance that what if it doesn't sell in time and then you've just wasted all this time being off the market. Well, yes, it is contingent offers typically are written where it's open predication, where another person can come in and put an offer. But a lot of times buyers are not looking at those homes. Um, it's a lot of times, depending on what sites they, they're looking on, it might still show pending and a, an average person wouldn't know. 
Um, a lot of times when it is predicated, once that house goes under contract, it, it's, if it's written properly, it's supposed to turn into closed predication so that that seller that's selling their house to buy your house doesn't lose your house because if they do, they would end up homeless. So typically it changes to closed predication. So a lot of times the buyers will call and say, hey, I wanna see 123 Banana Street. And then they say, oh yeah, it's, it's predicated. Let's see where, where it's at. And then we call and it's closed predication. They can't take an offer anyway. So a lot of times it's more legwork and buyers just don't typically go see those homes. So it does make your home less desirable when it comes to that. But if you do consider a contingent offer, having it contingent once their house is under contract would probably be best case scenario. So waiting till their house is already on the market and already pending, and then they come to you and ready to buy your house, that's typically a better route to go or the way that I like to write the offers, if it's contingent, is would be we will give you X amount of time to get your home sold. But if it's not sold within X amount of days or X amount of weeks, we're, this contract's going to be null and void. And then you can go back active on the home. Because what you don't want to do is give them 120 days to sell their home and then them not sell it. So if you narrow that down and say, yeah, We'll negotiate, we'll give you time to get your house on the market, we'll give you 20 days to get it sold. And if it's not under contract, then we're going back on the market active. And whenever you can keep your house on the market if you want, if it goes back under contract and we're still available, come back. So that's kind of how I would typically write it, but of course every agent does it different. Um, every big agent has a different strategy. So make sure that you if you are one to entertain a predicated contingent offer, you um, you understand the whole thing because it gets very, very complicated and you need to make sure it's written properly in the, in the contract before accepting it. And tip number 10. So offer seller incentives. So what exactly is a seller incentive? So this is something where we can typically advertise on the MLS um, you know, sellers willing to offer $10,000 towards a buyer's buy down. Like, and that's when a seller can offer whatever amount of money to the, the buyer to be able to buy down their interest rate. Um, they can maybe incentivize them just saying like, we'll give you X amount of money towards your closing costs. Another good incentive, but this one's tricky, is you can offer buyer broker fees. So as you know, buyers out in the market already have agreements with their agent and they're going to look at houses. So if you say, hey, and this is why it's tricky. We can only advertise this off of the MLS. We can post it on our social media post. When an agent calls to show it, we can tell them. Um, we can send an email as soon as it's, you know, they request a showing for it. We can do an email blast. We can put it on our own website. We cannot put it on the MLS. But and that's only because with the lawsuit, part of the settlement was that we will no longer mention the word commission, offer commission, anything with commission is gonna be allowed to go in the, to the MLS. So um, that cannot be on there. But we can still incentivize that way and say, hey buyer, we are, um, you know, we're offering 1%, 2%, 3%, 8%, 10%, whatever incentive you want to give towards a buyer broker commission. Um, you can incentivize two different ways. You can say, hey, you know, we'll give 2% for the buyer broker fee. We'll give, I don't know, 10000 towards closing costs. You can incentivize that way um, just to attract more buyers. At the end of the day, once the offer comes in, that's when um, you can make sure that those numbers work. You know, if they come in in low ball and then you say, wait, I was giving this in, you know, in incentives, but if you're not giving me a full price offer, I'm not tied to that. So um, making sure that it's spelled out in the, in the contract is going to be important. But yes, to attract some of those buyers right now, incentives probably wouldn't hurt to just kind of incentivize and try to get them into your door. And number 11 is going to be get the repairs done to your home. So like, for example, 
I know that a piece of my siding up really high in my dormer blew off at some point. It was after the hurricane, but I noticed it. I found it in my yard. I looked around the house and I seen it's like a, a piece like this big. I haven't put it back up there. If I was going to sell my house, I'm putting that back up there. Um, because having the home, um, all the deficiencies that you know is going on, going on with the house, maybe anything missing, anything broken, you want to get all those things fixed before you actually market the home to get a buyer. Buyers are looking at the condition of the homes, and so when they see that little piece of plastic blown down, they're going to want to offer me less and also wonder what other things did I let go of my house. I mean, I know that it's just that, but... Um, you know, you, if you know of any deficiencies with the house, go ahead and get those things corrected. Some of the important things is, you know, you want your stove working. You want to make sure your dishwasher is working. You want to make sure the microwave is working. The, all the electrical components of your house, you want to make sure that all electro, electrical stuff is working because a buyer is going to typically going to do an inspection of the home. Um, but even before that, they see the way that your home is maintained and taken care of during their viewing of the home. And a lot of times buyers are going to choose the homes that are um, better maintained and look well taken care of. And then they're going to take the extra step to do an inspection of your home. And when they do an inspection, having less on there to make it look like you know, you really do take care of your home and you love your home, it's going to make them feel more comfortable to buy it. Um, people that let their home go and, you know, the AC broke, so they have window units. The stove broke, so they just use an air fryer. You know, once these things start to trickle down and a buyer's going to look for a home, it's going to look less desirable and all they see is dollar signs being thrown up because they are thinking like it's going to cost a fortune and then they're just going to walk and then not even be interested in your home. So another thing that I would highly recommend before listing is to go ahead and you fix your own things that you know, because you know what you know, but the bad part is you don't know what you don't know. So we don't want any surprises when a buyer is going to pay to do an inspection on your home. So you can do a pre-listing inspection. You can still use a licensed inspector that's with the state. Um, your realtor, I'm sure, can refer you to somebody that they use. And before you get your home on the market, get that inspector to come in and do a full blown out inspection of your home. And they will give you a report. And the things that you think is important that you, if you were buying a home, what is important? Because remember, that's going to be the, the playbook that the buyers are going to see when they get your home under contract. And sometimes they use that for negotiating, which I absolutely hate. But if you do a pre-listing inspection and you go through and you fix all those things that you didn't even know about that, you know, it could be a simple fix. Um, when you do it yourself before you list it, a lot of times you don't have to get a licensed person to get it done as long as it's getting done right. But once that buyer comes in and will request for you to get it fixed, a lot of times they want a licensed person to actually do the work so that they can make sure it's done correctly. And so that can actually save you money as well if you can just get those things done beforehand. Another good thing about having that inspection is you can get that inspector to come back, check the things that you fixed, clean up that report, and we can share that report with a buyer. And we're only doing that just to say, hey, look, we've done checked out the house. This is everything we know about the house. Please submit an offer based on what we know about the house. And that is gonna make negotiating through the inspection period way easier. We're not going to be nervous of what did they find? Did they find anything? What are they going to ask for? Because at that point, they're going to only possibly ask for something that maybe your inspector missed, but a lot of times it's nothing. So um, that's something that I would really look into. It's less than, I guess, depends on your market. Um, here, it would be less than $500 to get a whole home inspection done. And um, it's well worth it because for $500 it could save you thousands during inspection no no negotiating. So in this softening market, having your home in tip top shape and condition will help your home sell quicker. And tip number 12, choose your realtor wisely. Make sure you have someone hardworking, full-time, um, current, keeps current with the market. Um, knows your local area, where you're looking to sell. 
um, make sure that they're present on social media, um, make sure that they're willing to invest of their time and their money in your home to sell your home. Because in today's market, it's not throw it on the market and it's gonna sell itself. It does take time, it takes money, it takes work. And so having an agent that is a full-time agent, not someone just doing it on the side, you know, I'll get to it when I get off, I can't really work on it right now, I'll get in trouble, my boss might say something, you know, I can't really dabble in real estate while I'm on their time. You know, real estate is a now market. Typically when, for example, when a lead comes through, if someone's calling your phone, if I don't answer, they've done hung up and called another agent. So making sure that you have an agent that is on time, knows the market, um, and someone that is going to be there to work for you and get your home sold, advise you, help you, um, come up with a marketing plan, strategy, and all of these things is going to be um, a really key factor because your realtor through this process is going to be your best friend. Like, I always say, like, I have tons of friends. Like, my friends are typically a little more temporary because I have, like, really, really good best friends, and those are typically my clients that I'm working with on a daily basis. Like, we cut, we talk a lot um, while we're going through the process, and then we kind of, like, take a break. We take a break, and then we just talk every once in a while. So it's so funny that I say that because, uh, I don't know. I say my friends are temporary, but then we, like, then we're like long distance friends because we still stay friends. I still stay friends with my clients like for years and years to come. But when we are actually going through the process, we're besties. That's your partner. That's who you call for everything, every advice. Um, you know, they're here to guide you. So make sure when you choose your realtor, you're choosing somebody because you you know like you know them, you like them, and you trust them. So um, if you have any questions, I'm Brandy Nichols. I am the broker and realtor at Brandy Nichols Realty. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm never too busy to help. <laughs>